So welcome everybody. Um, it's great to have everyone here today. And uh, if, uh, if you are new here, uh, you'll, we'll just catch up a little bit. We've been studying about what we believe in, and um, that's so essential. If you worship a God that you don't know, um, then it's basically an idol. It's something that you've fabricated in your mind. Um, but here we want to make sure that we know what we believe in, and that should produce worship based off of what the knowledge of who he is and who he says he is in his word. And so we've, we've gone through some of his attributes. We've gone through that he's truly God or fully God and fully man. And um, so today we have a topic that is a big one because it's what the, the whole Bible is about. It's about our redemption. It's about the atonement. Um, it's why a Christian can sit there and not tremble in their seat um, and worry about their eternal destination and facing the wrath of God. Um, and if you're not a believer, it's the alternative. And uh, I pray that this would uh, awaken in you uh, a re and realize that, that you need Christ and you need to turn to him today. Um, for tomorrow's not promised. And so um, I just want you to imagine that our sovereign, all-powerful, all-knowing, omnipresent God, who needed no one, willed to create an entire universe, strategically placing the planets in perfect alignment, knowing all the stars by their name. He made them to be, he, he out of dirt, he created a life in his image, birthing humanity. He made them to be eternal, without sin, but gave them a will and a responsibility. From eternity past, he knew every single person who would ever be, from conception to birth. He knew every thought they would think, every word they would speak, and everything they would do in all of history. He would not create evil, but he decreed it or allowed it to come into existence through the selfish will of mankind. Knowing that given humanity a will, they will choose what was right in their own eyes. Knowing that their will would lead to the entrance of sin, causing them to become slaves to their sin. He decreed things to take place, leading and directing humanity, permitting them to take sinful wrong turns so that in the end, they will see his sovereign hands guiding everything. Using evil, the evil of humanity, he would gather a people among the people to call his own. Those who he would recreate regenerate, make born again through atonement where a price was paid for them, no longer slaves to sin, he gives them the gift of faith. A people justified because of him, for they are clothed with his righteousness, the righteousness of Christ. As they work out their salvation with fear and trembling, it is he who is doing the work in them. All of this to lead them to glory where they will be healed from their sins, sickness, and death, and all will be restored to its original perfection. A reflection of Christ to illuminate worship unto the Father for all of his marvelous works of grace. So today as we talk about the atonement, I'm going to be using Isaiah 53. And just to give you a, a, an overview of Isaiah 53, it was written 700 years before Christ came to this earth. And it's considered to be the fifth gospel because it is packed with information that uh, details uh, the gospel of Jesus Christ and his life and his sufferings that he did on behalf of us. The first half of Isaiah talks about our sinfulness. And the second half talks about salvation. In Isaiah, we see a voice calling, preparing the way. In Isaiah 40, the verse 3, it says, a voice cries out. In the wilderness, prepare the way of the Lord. Make straight in the desert a highway for our God. And then in the New Testament, we find the fulfillment in John the Baptist. When the, we see in Mark uh, chapter 1, 1 through 4, the beginning of the gospel of Jesus Christ, the Son of God, as it is written in Isaiah the prophet, Behold, I send my messenger before your face. He will prepare away the voice crying out in the wilderness. And then the end of Isaiah in chapter 65 and 66, it talks about the new heavens and the new earth. And in the end of Revelation, we see the new heavens and the new earth. 
Uh, you could say that the book of Isaiah begins where the New Testament begins and ends where the New Testament ends. And so this is why we're going to be using Isaiah 53. This is one of my favorite chapters that details probably better than any other um, chapter in the Bible, really, who Jesus is, what he looked like to a certain degree, and what he experienced in great detail. And so I want you to imagine as we read this what uh, Jesus uh, is going through and what he's dealing with as, he's, as we read this description of him. So if you have your Bibles, let's turn to Isaiah 53. Who has believed what the Lord has heard from us? And to whom has the arm of the Lord been revealed? For he grew up before him like a young plant, and like a root out of dry ground. He had no form or majesty that we should look at him, no beauty that we should desire him. He was despised and rejected by men, men of sorrows, acquainted with grief. As one from whom men hide their faces, he was despised, and we esteemed him not. Surely he has borne our griefs and carried our sorrows, yet we esteemed him not. We esteemed, esteemed him stricken, smitten by God, and afflicted. But he was pierced for our transgressions, he was crushed for our iniquities. Upon him was the chastisement that brought us peace, and with his wounds we are healed. All we like sheep have gone astray, we have turned, every one, to his own way, and the Lord has laid on him the iniquity of us all. He was oppressed, <clears throat> he was afflicted, yet he opened not his mouth, like a lamb that is led to slaughter, like a sheep that before it shears is silent, so he opened not his mouth. By oppression and judgment, he was taken away. And as for this generation, who considered that he was cut off out of the land of the living, stricken for the transgression of my people, and they made his grave with the wicked and with the rich man in his death, although he had done no violence and there was no deceit in his mouth. Yet it was the will of the Lord to crush him. He, was put, to, they, he put him to grief. When his soul makes an offering for guilt, he shall see the, his offspring, and he shall prolong his days. <clears throat> the will of the Lord shall prosper his hand, and out of anguish of his soul he shall see and be satisfied. By his knowledge shall the righteous one be my servant, make many to be accounted righteous, and he shall bear their iniquities. Therefore I will divide him a portion with the many, and he shall divide the spoil with the strong." Because he poured out his soul to death and was numbered with the transgressors, yet he bore the sin of many and makes intercession for the transgressors. So it concludes the reading of the word. And so the first part I want you to understand is he lived your life for you. We look at the beginning of Isaiah 53, verses 1, and it says, Who has believed? And who has the arm of the Lord revealed? And then you look in John chapter 12, just to confirm that this is about Jesus. Jesus confirms it. Chapter 12, 32 through 41, Jesus is talking to the people. And he says, when I am high and lifted up on the earth, I would draw all people to myself. And he said this to show what kind of death he was going to die. And here the crowd are hearing this, and they still don't get it. They say, what? The law says Christ is going to remain forever. And you're telling us he's going to die. What does this mean? Who is the Son of Man? And he did many signs before them. And yet they still didn't get it. They didn't believe. The Lord had not revealed it to them yet. And then we see this later on, that this was all done to fulfill the prophecy of Isaiah that we just read. And in verse 41 of John 12, it says, Isaiah said these things because he saw his, Christ, glory and spoke of him. Has the Lord revealed these things to you? The atonement will mean nothing to you if it hasn't been, if your eyes have not been opened. So I pray that this is happening right now, that he's opening your eyes. It says he grew up. He grew up like a young plant. The creator of the universe, 
descended from his heavenly throne, came among the crea his creation as a seed produced through the Holy Spirit. In the woman that Christ created and matured to manhood like a young plant that grows, truly man and truly God, he became like man in every way so that he could be our substitute and bear the wrath of God that we deserved. It goes on to say that he had no form or majesty that we should look at him, no beauty. See, so this is something that we don't see in the movies. Hollywood likes to portray him as a blonde haired, blue eyes, shampoo model. That's not what the Bible says about Jesus. It says that there was nothing about him that would have called your attention to him. There was nothing that would have, he was such a man of brokenness and sorrow. Imagine this, that God of the universe is dwelling amongst his creation, creation that's rebelling against him every single moment in front of him. It's all happening in front of him. And he's dealing with this every single day while bearing the temptations that we all face as our substitute. You would be a man of suffering as well. So there's nothing about him from his exterior, not his beauty, not his, what, what was, uh, it wasn't that he, he was a man that was just skipping along. We see this, that he was kind of, in the movies, that he's kind of, everyone just following him and everything's just all great until he gets crucified. That's not what we see here. We see that what drove people to him was this radiant love that came from him. And it was the authority that he spoke of. And also, that was the very thing that got him killed as well. It goes on to say, as we see, that he bore our griefs. He was a man of sorrow and acquainted with grief. And one from whom men should hide their faces. He was despised. And he bore our griefs and carried our sorrows. So in that first part, we see a description of him. He was a man of sorrows, and he was acquainted with grief. And the second part describes the source of those griefs and sorrows. He bore our griefs. He bore our sorrows. So why was he a man of sorrows and griefs? Because of ours. He was our substitute. He, he took that upon himself. He lived on this earth perfectly without sinning while witnessing sin, our, our sin, and carried the weight of it as our substitute so that we could be freed from it. He came as our perfect prophet, announcing good news of the gospel. He went to the cross with the grief of our sins upon his shoulders as our perfect priest to make the final sacrifice on our behalf. And then it goes on to say that we esteemed him stricken, smitten by God. In Deuteronomy, it talks about that a man hanged on a tree is cursed. And that's what they believe. They believe that this man was cursed, that he got what he deserved, because of, that's what the law says. However, in 1 Peter 2, 24, it says, He himself bore our sins in the, his body on the tree, that we might die to sin and live to righteousness. What appeared to be a curse, a failure, in reality was a victory over sin and death. <coughs> Paul Washer once said that there has never been a moment in your life that wasn't tainted by sin. And there was never a moment in his life that was tainted by sin. You have never loved God in a way that God deserved to be loved. But there never was one moment in the life of the man Jesus Christ that he did not love God as God deserves to be loved. So the question is, why is this atonement necessary? And if you look at chapter 53, 5 through 6, there's some key words there, as you can see on the screen. But he was pierced for our transgressions. Think about that word, transgressions. That means a rebellion against him. It's, it's a rebellion against the things of God. He, he did this because of our rebellion. He was obedient because of our rebellion, so that we could become obedient. He bore our iniquities. We were like sheep that have gone astray. And he had his, the iniquities of us all laid upon him. The sacrifices were common in the pagan world. To us it might seem very, uh, very grotesque to, for God to say, go kill some animals, make sacrifices on my, on, to make atonement for yourself. But the reality is that in the pagan world, they would kill their own children. 
in order to get fertility or to have good crops or whatever it might be. So this was very common. And for God to go and to say, make a sacrifice of an animal was a constant reminder for them day after day that their sinfulness, their, it was a reminder of their sinfulness that, that was repeated over and over again that would never take away sin fully. The sacrifices in the Holy of Holies reminded them of the great divide between God and humanity. You can see this in Isaiah 1, uh, chapter 1, and he, God is fed up with the people. They're, they're doing the sacrifices, but they keep on sinning. They keep on turning from him. And he says, I've had enough of your burnt offerings. I take no pleasure in them. Bring your worthless offerings no longer. I can't adore your iniquity. I will hide my face from you if you come to me in prayer. I will not listen. Your hands are covered with blood. We see this, the, the gravity of sin that we take so lightly. We fail to understand the nature and character of God and sin. The judge of all the earth is righteous and perfect in the administration of his justice. Not only will he punish sin, but he must punish sin. There was one time a story of a, a woman that went and got uh, photos taken, professional photos. And she comes home and she has her photographs and she comes home to her husband and she says, Honey, uh, I, want, I got these professional photos taken. I want you to take a look at them. And he opens them up and she goes, Do you think they give me justice? And he looks at him and he goes, You don't need justice, you need grace. <laughs> That's what we don't want. We don't want God's justice because if we get his justice, we all would end up in hell and bear the wrath that we deserve. We need grace. It's one sin that's all it takes. We sin so often that we don't think much of it and it's gravity. We make excuses for it. However, when you encounter a holy God and you see the sins in light of his purity, you will see how dead in sin, how enslaved in sin you are, and how much you deserve justice, which is condemnation. Think about Isaiah chapter 6. Isaiah comes and sees God, and he has this vision of God. And he says he sees the Lord on the throne, high and lifted up. And there was these seraphims, these creatures that God perfectly created to be in his presence. Six wings, two that would cover their faces because he was in the, they're, they're in the glory of God. And two that would cover their feet, their feet because they were on holy ground, and two to fly. And they would cry out, holy, holy, holy is the Lord of hosts. The whole earth is full of his glory. And the foundations of the thresholds trembled at the voice of him who called out. And what was his response when he saw this? When a man became encountered the holiness of God, he said, Woe is me, I am ruined, because I am a man of unclean lips. And I live among people of unclean lips. My eyes have seen the king the Lord of hosts. R.C. Sproul once said, when we understand the character of God, when we grasp something of his holiness, then we will begin to understand the radical character of our sin and hopelessness. So what took place during the atonement? If you look at chapter, uh, verse 7 of 53, it says, he was oppressed. Think about these key words, he was oppressed. He was afflicted, and yet he never opened his mouth. This man of sorrows that came down off of the throne of God, for you and me, he came down and he was oppressed. They treated him like a criminal. They beat him, they, they, they afflicted him, even throughout his life. He was encountered, he was called a blasphemer, a drunkard. He was called, named God of the universe. Think about that. The God that created them, they were calling him these names. They were treating him this way. And yet he never opened his mouth. He was like a lamb that went to slaughter. If you ever seen a lamb go to slaughter or be sheared, they're silent. He never opened his mouth. We often think of the atonement as, his, as the death on the cross. However, the price that was paid was through 33 years of God and human flesh on this earth. Humbling himself, taking the temptations that we deserve, constantly enduring these things, dwelling among a rebellious creation and dealing with their sins. And yet he was silent because it was voluntary. He came because he wanted to. Verse 8 says he was, by oppression and judgment, he was taken away, he was arrested, he was treated like a criminal, and he was cut off 
from the land of the living. He was murdered, dying a horrific death. On behalf of who? It says, stricken for the transgression of my people. So who is his people? For God so loved the world, he gave his only son. Here John, being a Jew, is talking about that he loves the world, not just the Jews. He loves everyone. He loves, he loves the Gentiles as well. He's making redemption for all mankind, not just the Jews. So that's the word, the world. But get more specific. It says we're sheep that have gone astray. He died for a sheep. You can replace the word sheep and maybe put your name there. And think about John chapter 10, 14 through 30, when it says, I'm the good shepherd, and I know, I know my own. Now think about the words in Matthew, the terrifying words, depart from me, I never knew you. Now think about this. I'm the good shepherd, I know my own, and my own know me. Just as the Father knows me, and I know the Father. That's how intimate this relationship is with his sheep. I lay down my life for the sheep. Change the name sheep for your name. I have other sheep from this fold, talking about the Gentiles, and they will listen to my voice, and they would unite with the Jews, and they would become one flock and one shepherd. And it says, I've told you these things, but you don't believe because you don't, you're not my sheep. My sheep hear my voice, and I know them, and they follow me. I give them eternal life, and they will never perish, and no one will snatch them out of my hand. My Father, who has given them to me, <clears throat> is greater than all. And he was made, made his grave among the wicked, and with a rich man in his death, although he had done no violence, and there was no deceit in his mouth. And there we see, 700 years before Jesus came to this earth, they buried him in the, with the wicked like a criminal. And in a tomb owned by an influential man, named Joseph. Yet he was innocent. Jesus Christ died because of our guilt. And then verse 10, it says, it was the will of the Lord to crush him. Think about that word, crush. It was the will of the Lord to crush him. That's graphic language. If you talk about someone being crushed, Jesus was crushed throughout his life emotionally, but then also he went and he was crushed physically. That they had these, these whip that had bone that was on the ends of it. And every time they would whip him, it would grab into his skin and yank it out. Until you would actually see vital organs. That's how bad Jesus was beaten. He was crushed. And yet he stayed silent. And it was the will of God to do it. It was God making atonement for you and I. He was bearing the wrath of God that you and I deserved. You think about that picture there. That's what God, Jesus was doing for us. It was the will of the Lord who put him to grief and his soul makes an offering for guilt. But that's not the end of it. That's not where it ends. It goes on to say that he shall see his offspring, you and I, and, what, and the Lord will prosper his hand. And out of the anguish of his soul, he will be satisfied. He will make many accounted righteous, and he shall bear their iniquities. So there you go is the definition of atonement. If you look at the word at and one, it's at harmony or in harmony. That's where we get the terminology at, at, at one with nature, things like that. So it's at one with God. That's atonement. Romans 6, 23 says the wages of sin is death. So the actual definition of atonement is a reparation. It's a, a satisfaction of a debt that you owe. And so that debt is owed for specific people, specific purpose, for your sins, so that you can have reconciliation with God. The wages of our sin is death, either our death or the death on our behalf. There had to be a satisfaction of death in order for there to be reconciliation. 
And you look at these words that in, in Romans 5, 6 through 11. And you just look at those key words there. While we were still weak, Christ died. So we were helpless, he was strong. And then it goes on to say, while we were still sinners, Christ died for us. Now that's love. That's love in action right there. It goes, if you look just a little bit before there, it says, for one would scarcely die for the righteous person, though perhaps for a good person one would dare to even die. But God shows his love for us that while we were still sinners, Christ died for us. And then it goes on to say, since therefore we have now been justified by his blood, we've been saved by the wrath of God. That's what took place on the cross. He saved us from the wrath of God. And then these are telling words that people don't want to talk about today. For while we were still enemies, we were reconciled by the death of his son. And while we were reconciled, we were saved by his life. And so we rejoice in God through our Lord Jesus Christ. And we've received this reconciliation. See, many people don't like to talk about the wrath of God and the fact that God is angry with the wicked every single day. This is Isaiah, I mean, Psalm 7, 11. Uh, Psalms 5 talks about that he actually hates the evildoers. And yet he's, he's calling us that we were enemies of God, separated from him. However, just as he commands us to forgive others because we've been forgiven, or to love our enemies, think about these. He tells us to love our enemies because we were enemies. That that's the beauty of God, that he's able to love us so much that he's able to love his enemies and die for them in their place. And that he's made atonement so we can be reconciled. Reconciled to the point that now we can be called children of God through adoption. And then it goes on in verse 12 to say, I will divide him a portion with the men. And he shall divide us the spoil with the strong, because he poured out his soul to death and was numbered with the transgressors. Yet he bore the sin of many and makes intercession for the transgressors. So just think about those, that first section there. Divide him a portion and divide the spoil with the strong. That might seem odd terminology, but think about some of, of like the ancient times when a king would come into a place and would, would have victory over uh, in war, and they would take the plunder and divide it amongst the, the, their, their, their uh, armies. This is language that's talking about victory. He came in sorrow. He came as weak man and, and without majesty. He came and broken and crushed, and yet he finished victoriously. Christ lived the life of our, on behalf of our sin, carried our sins and bore the wrath that we deserved. He tore the veil to the Holy of Holies. Christ conquered death. Christ conquered Satan. Christ covers the sheep with his righteousness. Christ works through his people, through the, his spirit. Christ is reigning now at the right hand of God. He was a man of sorrows and grief. He was rejected and despised. He was oppressed. He was crushed, killed. But that only lasted a moment in light of eternity. And after all that Christ did for us, he hasn't stopped it. He's making intercession for us. Now think about that word. So he lived 33 years suffering and enduring temptations that every single one of us deal with. He knows. It's that in Hebrews talks about he's sympathetic to what we go through. And then if you look at John chapter 17, and here Jesus is about to be ascended to heaven to the right hand of God. And what does he do? He stops for a moment, not only to pray for the disciples that are there in that moment, but he also clarifies and says, and also those that will come to salvation through them, us. And just a portion of this, if you look at it. I am glorified in you. you, you I glorified you on earth, having accomplished the work that you have gave me to do. I manifested your name to the people whom you've given me out of the world. Yours they were, and you gave them to me. I'm praying for them. God of the universe did all these things for you, suffered for you, 
He saw all of your sinfulness and your nastiness. He knows what's in your heart and in your mind, what you do behind closed doors. And yet, He prays for you. And those that He bought with a price, He says, He reminds the Father, they're mine. You gave them to me. Don't give up on them yet. I'm still working in them. I'm still sanctifying them. I'm still making them more like me. He's working through us. He's praying for us. Who received the glory? Not us. Christ alone. And it says, I'm not praying for the world. I'm not praying for the whole world, he says. I'm praying for those you've given me. That's, that's very specific. It's very it's intimate. It's my people. It's my sheep. It's specific names. He's thinking of you and I. And he says, I'm glorified in them. What was accomplished? When Christ cried out, it is finished, he was using a common commercial term that is used when people make a full final installment of a series of payments. It's just like you're saying, paid in full. When he was on the cross, he said, it's paid in full. Jonathan's debt is paid for. I don't deserve it. Sin entered through Adam, but salvation came through Christ. Noah's Ark pictures Jesus as the true Ark, saving his chosen people from the wrath of God. He was the ram Abraham offered as a substitute to his son for his son Isaac. He was the Passover lamb with the blood over the door to protect his chosen people from the wrath of God. The five major offerings in Leviticus was fulfilled in Jesus Christ. The prophets pointed to the greater prophet Christ. He was Hosea who purchased his prostitute wife from slavery. The priests and sacrifices pointed to Christ who became the perfect high priest to enter the Holy of Holies and lay, laid his own life down on the altar, tearing down the veil of separation. Christ was lifted high on the cross and now he's high and lifted up on the right hand of God. All of history was humanity fleeing from obedience and they longed to govern themselves. However, it was God who patiently uses every circumstance through history to paint his story, drawing his elect to himself. Just think about these words of what took place in salvation. Romans 8, 29 through 35. Those he foreknew, he knew them, he knew sheep. He predestined to be conformed to his son, to be saved. And those he predestined, he called them. And when he called them, when he called you, when he called me, he, we heard the gospel for the first time and it, it awoke in something in us. Like we started to see our sins for what it really is. We started seeing it in the eyes of a holy God. And that calls us to repent. It's a gift. And those he called, he justified. It's as if Jesus, you go and stand before a holy God. If you stand with your own righteousness, you can't stand before a holy God because we're not righteous. But it's as if Jesus says, step back, son. And he gets in front of me. And every time Jesus, God looks at me, he sees his son. Those who justified, he also glorified. Glorified is the day we will be freed from sin, healed from our sicknesses and sinfulness, and we'll be in glory with him. But if you look at that, it's all past tense. Justified, glorified, predestined. All is done in eternity past and on the work that Christ did on our behalf. A.W. Pink says this, each of the three persons of the Blessed Trinity is concerned with our salvation. With the Father, it's predestination. With the Son, propitiation or atonement. With the Spirit, regeneration, making us born again. The Father chose us. The Son died for us. The Spirit quickens us. The Father was concerned about us. The Son shed his blood for us. And the Spirit performs his work within us. What one did was eternal, what the other did was external, and what the Spirit does is internal. Thomas Watson once said, Christ went more willingly to the cross than we do to the throne of grace. He went more willingly than we, than we do to him, to pray, to seek him, to live for him. Colossians 3, Five, 3 through 5 says, Seek the things above, where Christ is. There's your victory. Seated at the right hand of God. 
Set your minds on the things that are above. And then it goes on to say, Put to death, therefore, what is earthly to you, sexual immorality, impurity, passion, evil desire, covetousness, which is idolatry. It's idolatry. It's anything that you put before God. So we, he's calling us to holiness. 1 Corinthians 6, 19-20 says, Or do you not know that your body is a temple of the Holy Spirit within you, whom you have from God? You are not your own. You were bought with a price. So glorify God in your body. Understanding what Christ did on your behalf must humble ourselves. Knowing we were bought with a price must cause a passion for holiness. Christ is worthy of our obedience. He's worthy of our complete devotion. If we don't long to glorify him in all that we do and say here on earth, why in the world would we want heaven? For that will be our focus in eternity. So let us continue to offer up a sacrifice of praise. We no longer have to sacrifice. Thank God. I don't can't kill an animal. <laughs> but I can offer a sacrifice of praise. And that be the fruit of our lips and the acknowledge of his name. He gathered us. He purchased us. He justified us. He adopted us. You see, it's he, he, he did it, he did it, he did it. This free gift that he's given us. He sealed us with the Holy Spirit. He's changing us in preparation to dwell with us when all is renewed. <coughs> Heavens and earth united as one with God and his people singing. Worthy are you to take the scroll to open up the seals, for you were slain. And by your blood you ransom people for God from every tribe, language, people, and nation. You see, the, the full context of, of history was all about saving you and I. It was all about dwelling with his people. And this is what, this is what he, he did for us. So I ask you, what are you doing for him? Do you think about these things? And the same sacrifice that he made for us, what sacrifices have you made for him? It says, you're not your own. You were bought with a price. This is something that should, that should humble us greatly. We should meditate on these things. I need to hear the gospel every single day to remind me that I'm bought with a price, that I can kill sin in my life and be more like Christ. And so if you don't know him, today's the day to do it. Today is the day to repent and turn your, to Christ and Christ alone. Not in your good works and what you can do. That won't earn you anything. It's like filthy rags. But trust in the works that Christ did on your behalf. Your, your works will be the fruit of, what you, of your salvation. That's what produces fruit that you begin to do, uh, go out and, and evangelize and help people and, and do good things for one another. That's the fruit because that's the works that God is doing in you. But it won't earn you anything. And so, put your faith in Christ alone. Repentance means to turn away from your sins, to reject your sins. To put your faith in Christ and say, I am helpless and I cannot do this on my own. I need you. I reject my sin. And put it all in Him. John Calvin once said, I gave up everything for Christ and what did I find? everything in Christ. And for those of us that are believers, this should be an encouragement. It should, it should be something that we think about and we think, 33 years he did this for me. He knew my name. He knew, what, he knew every sin I was going to do, and yet he still did it for me. How humbling is that? And so if you need, any, if you need prayer, if you need time to, to pray with one another, this is the opportunity to do so. We're oftentimes so quick to, uh, to not think about these things. And, and so we're, if I was up here talking about favorite sports teams, I could, I could bring such emotion in you, and you would be so either excited or you would be angry or you would be whatever it would be, and you would be thinking about it when you got home. But how quickly we are to forget about the spiritual things. This is why this life is only a passing place. 
We have a, the joy of knowing eternity is waiting for us. But which eternity is waiting for you? And so this is something we should be thinking about. So let's pray. Father God, thank you for thinking of us, making a plan that was specifically thinking of each one that's here today. That you were willing to bear the wrath that I deserved. You live the life that I deserve, and you, you understand my, my temptations that I go through, and you are sympathetic, and you are praying for me. You don't allow anything to snatch me out of, my, out of your hand. You're preserving me to the end, and I thank you for that. And that I, I, want, to, I want that to produce obedience, complete obedience to you. And I pray this for every single person here. We're in this together. We're in this battle against the spiritual, against the flesh, Together, and that's the point of the church, is to encourage one another, to, to, to spur us on to love and good deeds. And so I pray, Lord God, that the church will begin to be the church. It will be your bride that will, that will bring you honor and glory. It will be beautiful to your eyes. And that the, the sacrifices of worship that we give you will be swing and sent to your nose. And I pray for every single person here that you, as they go home, that they will meditate on this. And for those that don't know you, that you will call them to yourself. In Jesus' name, amen. Amen.